y'all stand and worship with us this morning. Let's pray. 
let God speak what he has for us right now. What he has specifically for you. God, come awake in this place. God, allow us to receive with open minds and open hearts. Romans 8, verse 38 through 39, it says, For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is worth celebrating. That is why we sing. And this one thing remains. Nothing can separate us from his love.
no fear, doubt, worry, shame, guilt that can keep us from the love that God has for us. We thank you, Jesus. We pray today that we receive what you have for us, whether it's a word or confirmation, or maybe we have to trust you, God. Maybe you're asking us to trust you, Lord God. Would you give us that strength this morning to trust that you love us? You will never fail us, and you will never leave us. Amen. You may be seated. And, oh, there it is. How are y'all? Okay, how many of y'all were excited to come to church today? How many of y'all weren't excited but came anyway? It's okay. Oh, they're not going to admit. It's fine. I will tell you that in our house, we had half and half this morning, but everybody came anyway. So however you came to church today, we want you to know that we are so glad that you are here. And if you are new here, we would be honored if you would take a minute to fill out the digital connect card. So if you are in our audience, you can use your cell phone and scan this QR code. If you are watching online, you can click the link in the chat box. And basically, that's just going to take you to a page of links that's going to give you a little bit more information about us and give us a little bit more information about you. Also, through that QR code, you can submit your prayer requests. So every Monday here at Grace Fellowship, the staff gathers together to pray over each other, to pray over you, to pray over our communities. And we would love to continue to pray over those requests. So you can submit those there. Speaking of praying for our communities, we know here at Grace Fellowship, we are for our Look at y'all go for our communities. And we would love to love for you to continue to partner with us as we continue to be for our communities. And you can do that by giving through this QR code or through the Church Center app. Or if you are here in our auditorium, we have generosity boxes located around the back. Today, Pastor Chris is going to start a brand new series called Better Together. And he's going to talk to us about why it's important that we are here together. Welcome to Grace. Are you glad you came today? Yes. If you listen, being a part of something like that, man, we have an incredible team that leads us each week. I'm grateful for them. Yeah, give them, God is using them. Give them a hand. 
Glad you're joining us here in Paris. Those joining us online, it's a great day to be here. It's always a great day. I love being here with you guys, but it's a great day as we're kicking off a new series called Better Together. Listen, here's what I know is that we are hard, hardwired to need community, that God made us that way, that each of us have a need to find a place to belong. And whatever group we find a place to belong with will determine the quality and the direction of our lives. It will impact our lives and, and where we go and the kind of impact we make. And, and I want you to know this. If you are new to church, this is a great day to be here. Because what we're going to talk about today is something that I believe God wants to be unique to the church. It, it's a place where people can belong and experience community. But a community that is far more dynamic than any other community that you could experience. And our hope is that we, we want you to know <clears throat> is that this is a place where you can belong. And we hope that you'll decide to join us in our journey. My hope, my, uh, the goal for the series is that we'll grow a, a dynamic community uh, uh, of people, of, of believers where we live. And, and, and in this community, we'll see God change our lives, change our community's life, and ultimately change the world. And by the way that we, things are going in this world, it doesn't take much to look around and see that there's a lot of need for change. Not only that, the way the world's going, it can sometimes be difficult to follow God and, and really feel like we could make a difference in this world. But I truly believe is that as we begin to join together as a community and we go through this, this series, I want us to see and believe that we are better together. Let's pray as we get started. God, will you guide us in this time? Holy Spirit, move in this place. God, I pray, pray that we would hear from you today your truth, and that as we leave, Holy Spirit, you would help us um, live out your truth. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to start with this question today. <clears throat> who needs church? <laughs> we may say that, but who, who needs church? I mean, it's a question that, that we might be able to answer because, because a lot of us are like, well, everybody's supposed to go to church, right? But really, who needs church? Because today, in today's day and age, people are asking, who needs it? Because really, today, more than ever, it's easier not to go to church. You, you can access great teaching online 24-7 through YouTube, through church websites, through podcasts. You can get some good teaching. You can also get some really bad teaching. But you can get teaching out there 24-7. Not only that, if you want to hear some good singing and, and, and some good Christian music, nothing like you experienced. This is far greater, okay? You, you can find it out there just, just simply by telling your phone, hey, Siri, play God of Revival. Last service when I did that, someone's phone went boop, boop. I was like, see? Why go? It's easier not to. I mean, if, if you have kids, you had to get them up this morning. It's always a fight because you get them in their clothes. The next thing you know, they're out outside playing with the dogs in the mud. And you got to change them again. Then you get them in the car and you get them to church. And then you have the fight because you have got the one kid who moves at the pace of a turtle getting out of the car. And you're like, we got to get in there so we can get you checked in so I can get seat. Like we've got the struggle. It's just easier not to. I mean, we could just stay at home and make a cup of coffee and sit on the couch. It'd just be easy easier not to and maybe if you're married to someone and there's a struggle between like going to church and not maybe there's always that tension and that fight it'd just be easier not to maybe it's because you've come to the belief that man I just experienced God in nature I can experience God anywhere I, I, I really experienced God on the golf course or, or on the boat Maybe you, you like to go down to the water, down uh, and sink your feet in the water and soak up the sun and watch it set and feel the power of the saltwater gospel because it's as close to God as you can get. Thank you, Eli Young Band. <laughs> right? Because when it comes to actually going to church, for sometimes when we ask who needs church, it's, e it's just easier not to. Not only that, it's messy. You know why church is messy? Because people are there. 
And people are messy. Guess what? I'm messy. You're messy. And the only church that's not messy is the, is the church with nobody in it. And that church is no longer a church. It's just a building. And, and not only that, church is messy because we're messy. And then we come to church and we hear truth that confronts our mess. And if we're real honest, we don't really, we can acknowledge our mess, but we don't always want to do something about it. And we don't really always appreciate someone pre presenting truth that confronts our mess that says, man, we should probably do something about it. I mean, it's messy. It would be easier not to deal with that mess. Not only that, there's other messy people there. Well, you know they're a mess. And what if their mess begins to spill over into our mess? What a mess that would be. Who needs that mess? Not only that, it's costly. I have to get up early on the only day I could sleep in. Get up early and we got to get, get everybody ready. And we got to get, and I spend an entire hour there. You know what? We could tee off and, and be halfway through nine by the time church ends. I mean, it's costly. It costs us time. And then, and then we know that as we start listening to what the, what the pastor says and what scripture says, we should probably give back to God. And, and we don't really love to do that because we feel like our stuff is ours. And, 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 and so, you know what, if, if we're giving back, it costs us financially. And if we don't go, then all of a sudden it's really easy to ignore that and feel like that's something I need to do or just really conveniently forget about that. It's costly. Not only that, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about that, that God wants us to be in, all in as we follow. And if we did that, guess what? Then we're going to end up serving, which means we're at church longer. It's just so costly. Who needs that? You know what? It's also a battle. See, when we go to church, we're confronted with the fact that we're in a battle, a wrestle, a spiritual battle for the hearts and minds of people. And for real honest, it's kind of nice to just conveniently turn our backs to that, pull over the covers of our heads and pretend like it doesn't exist. We'd rather just ignore it. We don't want to go to church and be confronted with the fact that we're in a spiritual battle. I mean, who needs that? Who needs church anyway? Some of you are beginning to wonder why you came to church today. You're like, I had that argument. It didn't work. Some of you are going, hey, who are you and what did you do with Chris? But statistically speaking, out of the people who, who, who call themselves followers of Jesus, who say they believe, only about one third of the people who claim to be followers of Jesus attend church regularly. That, that church is a part of their regular behavior, regular habit. And for some, they don't really see why they need to go to church because they look, it's kind of like this sparkler. I've, I bought them together. The reality is I can take this one sparkler, I can light it, and it can do its job. It can function. It's nice to look at, and it's great. Why does this sparkler need any of those other sparklers? And in, here in America where we value individualism, uh, we have a hard time seeing why we need anyone else to personally follow God. So today, I want us to look at that question, who needs church? And to answer that question, I want to look at one of the first places we see this idea of church mentioned. It's actually mentioned by Jesus himself. He's with his followers, his closest followers that we refer to as, as the disciples. And a guy named Matthew is right there with him. And God used Matthew to record uh, his eyewitness account of Jesus' life and ministry and his death and his burial and resurrection. They, he, he wrote it down and we have it today. And we get to hear what, where Jesus first begins to talk about his church. It's in Matthew chapter 16. Starting with verse 18. If you have your Bibles, you can go to Matthew chapter 16. If not, it'll be right here on the LED Bible. Um, it says this, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? This is the most important question you could answer with your life, that you can answer in your life. Who is Jesus to you? Is he a good person? Did he teach good things? Did, did, he, did he do some real powerful things? Who is Jesus to you? And Jesus is asking his disciples, who do people think that I am? This is what they said. Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. They're saying, nice, people think that you're just, you came back from the dead and you're doing some amazing things. They just think you're one of the old prophets, one of the, the old men of God that God has brought back and you're, you're not even fully real. <laughs> and then he asked them this. 
but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Listen, in our context, this doesn't carry as much weight as it did back then. Because for thousands of years, the Jewish people were praying for, waiting for, hoping for the Messiah, the promised one, the one that God promised would come and, and take away the sin of mankind, to, to defeat the curse of sin, to rescue his people. So when Peter says this, he says, I recognize that you're the very one that God has sent to save us. And look what Jesus says. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of God, because uh, my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human beings. And he says, now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, that you have a new identity. And upon this rock, I will build my church and all the power, powers of hell will not conquer it. Look what he says. Upon this rock. What he's saying? Upon this belief that I am the Messiah, that I am the Savior of the world, that I am the one that God has sent. Upon this rock, this belief, I will build my church. We're going to look at that in just a second. And he says, and the powers of hell cannot conquer it. That it's going to be so powerful and so big that I'm going to use it in my battle against good and evil and evil will not win. Yeah. And he says, the, I will build my church. He uses the word ecclesia. See, unfortunately, we use the word church, uh, which comes back to the way they translated the Bible into key, to German, then later into English. And, and it takes on a context because we didn't have a word that fit what, what they meant. But ecclesia back in that time was a very common word in the Greek culture. Ecclesia simply meant, meant this. It was a gathering or assembly of people called out for a specific purpose. He says, upon this, this belief, this, this foundational truth, I'm going to build my gathering or assembly of people that, that are called out for a specific pur purpose. See, they used it for military move, movements and political movements and social movements. And Jesus says, I'm forming a new movement. See, this new belief formed a new belonging. It says, upon this belief, I'm going to create this new group of people. It's a new belonging. This, this belief formed a new belonging, a group of people that would gather together to be used by God. To change the world. And he says, <clears throat> the people who, get, who believe in this, I'm going to use them to conquer the gates of hell. And so what happens? Jesus lives. He, he gets crucified. They hang him on a cross. He raises from the grave. And, he, and he's seen by over 500 eyewitnesses all at once. And by the disciples multiple times, he did several things that proved that he'd physically risen from the grave. And then Acts 1, he gathers them together and tells them what he wants them to do. As a movement, as a group, what does he want them to do? He says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. What is that? Telling the people, telling people about me everywhere. That's what he's, he's saying, be my witnesses. That you'll go out and tell people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He said, man, that's what's going to happen. You're going to gather together. And when you gather together, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. See, when we put our faith in God, we receive the Holy Spirit. But at that time, he said, listen, I have to leave so that I can send my Holy Spirit. And so they gather together and they go back to Jerusalem after Jesus goes up into heavens. They gather back in Jerusalem in a room. And Acts 1, 15 tells us that at the time there were 120 gathered at that time. 120 believers. And the church was born. That was the beginning of the church. That's how it started. They gathered together in, a, in an upper room together. And they waited to see what God wanted them to do next. Have you seen that trend, how it started and how it's going on social media. Have you ever seen that before? It, it goes something like this, like how it started. This was our puppy when we got it during COVID. We call him Rona. Just kidding. His name's Tex. And uh, that's our, our puppy. Now, not the boy, the dog. It's a small horse, all right? That's a 10-year-old boy. That dog is huge. He's mammoth. Largest German shepherd I've ever owned. 
This is my wife and I, how it started. This is about a month after we became friends. We're just hanging out, same friend group. We took, we snapped this picture because I think we had the same shirt on. And the next thing you know, this is how it's going, right? A little bit has changed. And then how about this? This is how my beard started. And this is how it's going, all right? A lot has changed, all right? Now, here, here's the deal when it comes to the church. This is how it started. And according to some of the most recent data, this is how it's going. Over 2.5 billion people claim to be followers of Jesus. How did that happen? I mean, it's pretty obvious how the dog grew, right? That's, that makes sense. I mean, it's pretty obvious how things changed between me and Julie. She obviously fell in love with me. Hello. I mean, it's pretty obvious how my beard grew. That's natural. But how did that happen? How did it grow from 120 people who were scared to death, huddled together in an upper room, waiting to see what God wanted to do next, to 2.5 billion people? How did that happen? I want you to know this. It wasn't because of how popular Christianity was. They were hated by the Jews and the Romans. They, they were hated by, by, by every group around them at the time. As a result, they were persecuted. Many were burned at the stake. They were killed in gladiator games. They, they, families were mutilated together because of their faith. It wasn't because they were super smart or super wealthy and they knew how to buy their way around or, or, or outsmart other people. They're one of the most diverse group of people ever gathered together. They were multiracial, multi-generational, multi-socioeconomical. I mean, all the things that the enemy uses to divide us today was present right there. And somehow or other, God used this group of people, this uncommon group of people to change the world. See, that commitment. Is something God used to change the world. How did he do it? How did he, how did he grow this group of 100, 120 people in the midst of persecution and oppression? And over the course of the next 300 years, they would become the official religion of the Roman government, the very government that was persecuting them. How did that happen? Once you know, for one, they learned to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. It was the power of the Holy Spirit at work in them and through them to do things they could never do on their own. But, but it was in the context of community that they experienced the move of the Holy Spirit. See, see their uncommon commitment to one another is something God used to, as a catalyst for change. In, in Acts 2, we see that the Holy Spirit came and, and people began to be able to speak in different languages, other foreign languages where they, uh, the other foreigners who were living in Jeru Jerusalem could hear the truth about who Jesus was for themselves. And on that day, the day of Pentecost in a Acts 2, it says that, that 3,000 people believed and were baptized that day from a group of 120. And then I want you to see what they did next. Acts 2, 42 says, they devoted themselves to the, to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. It says they devoted themselves to these things, that, that, that they continued to gather together and, and they devoted themselves to, to this new shared behavior. You see this new belief formed this new belonging and that new belonging led to a shared behavior. They were devoted to one another and devoted to these three things. This word devoted actually uh, means to continue with intense effort and eagerness and intention despite difficulty. Is that how we would describe our commitment to God's church and God's people? <laughs> that, that we are eagerly and intensely committed and devoted to one another despite difficulty? Or are we quick to find reasons not to? Are we just looking for an out? See, they had an uncommon commitment to one another. It wasn't common in their day. They, they were devoted beyond what was common, what made, it, made sense. And when we see this kind of commitment, if we're not inside that community, we don't understand it. I mean, you see it a little bit with the CrossFit community. Uh, you, you know what I mean? If, if you know someone who, got, who does CrossFit, you know they do CrossFit. I did CrossFit for a short time uh, when I was in Odessa. And, and one of the things I learned in the midst of that is, is that what made them successful wasn't the workouts. 
The workout, you could get the workout online and do it yourself. You want to know what made them successful is their uncommon commitment to their community where they built each other up and they rallied behind each other and they shared their faith or shared their families and their lives outside of the gym. They had this crazy commitment and they, dis they, they discovered that the power of community is the power to change. And for the early church, they discovered the same to be true. That an uncommon commitment to their faith community was the catalyst for change. It's what God was using to change the world. They were devoted. They're devoted to, to three things, it says there in Acts 2.42, to learning together, to, to the apostles' teaching, the eyewitnesses or the apostles, who eyewitnesses of Jesus' life. They're devoted themselves to learning from him and, and what did Jesus say and what did Jesus do and how does that apply to our lives and how should that impact our lives? They were devoted to doing those things together. That's why we gather on Sunday, that we devote ourselves to studying his scripture that forms our lives and shapes our lives and tells us how we should live our lives. They devoted themselves to fellowship. The word fellowship was koinonia. It's not just friendship. It is a close relationship. It's actually an intimate relationship where it's more than just a friendship. It's like a brotherhood. It's like a sisterhood. It's like a family. And, and they shared such fellowship with each other that they treated each other like family. They, they took care of each other. They stood in the gap for each other. And, and if, if someone was killed for their faith, they would take their orphaned kids in and raise them for themselves. They shared the kind of fellowship that people looked at and and said, that doesn't make sense. They were devoted. Listen, that's why we do life groups. That's why life groups matter because that's where you find this kind of friendship. When we gather on Sundays, we can know each other by face and by name, but it's when you begin to share life together that we begin to experience the kind of fellowship that they had. And they devoted themselves to prayer. See, they didn't have the upper hand in their day and age. They didn't have an advantage. They weren't welcomed. So they, far better than probably anyone ever, understood their need for God. See, too often our need for God, our prayer life is determined by our, our, our recognition of our need for God. And they knew they needed him. And as a result, they gathered together and they prayed for one another and prayed for God to do things that they could never do for themselves. They prayed for miracles and miracles happened. It, it, it was in the context of community that God moved in a mighty way. Look, look at how, how Luke describes it in, in verse 43. It says, a deep sense of awe came over all of uh, them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. Miracles happened. God did miracles through the leaders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. Not just once a week, guys. They didn't gather just once a week. Each day they gathered and then they didn't just gather once, once, once a day uh, at the temple all together. Then they went to each other's homes. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. God gave them great favor with people that they never should have had favor with. But God gave them favor. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. They were devoted to one another. They had an uncommon commitment to this faith community. And God did something that we can never explain by human effort. They saw miracles happen. They, they were a community known for their generosity. They experienced great joy in the midst of persecution. They were the, the happiest, most at peace people there ever was. And the church grew. Who wouldn't want to be a part of that? Who wouldn't want to see God do something like that? Who wouldn't want to, want to be able to look up and say, look at God. Look what he's doing. 
See, I believe that that is what Jesus was talking about when he said, upon this belief, I will build my church. I will build my ecclesia, this group of people that will carry forward this movement, my mission in the world to change the world, to take the message of Jesus throughout the world so others will know. See, the church was God's plan A to reach the world. A Christian without a church is like a quarterback without a football team. He may be able to throw the ball a mile, but he's not going to score any touchdowns. What good does that do? A Christian can be saved without going to church, but they will never accomplish God's mission without a community of believers. That's God's design, that this new belief would create a new belonging and it would create this shared behavior. See, the church is God's plan. It's his plan A. A guy named Paul, we talk about him often. His life was radically changed by his experience with God. And God used him to start many of the early churches that we read about. And he wrote letters through the power of the Holy Spirit to these churches to tell them how to live out their faith. And in his letter to the Christians in Ephesus, he says this. God's purpose in all this was to use the church. The ecclesia is the word used there. The, the gathering of believers, the movement of, of followers of Jesus to display his wisdom and its riches in, in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. God's desire, his plan was to put the church on display so that the enemy would be able to see that he is not greater than God, that God is far greater, that he would use the miracle of the church to defeat the enemy and they would have to recognize the unmatched wisdom and greatness of our God. That's God's plan for the church. For us to position ourselves to experience God's power in our lives and our communities in the world, I believe we must return to that uncommon commitment to our faith family, to our faith community that we'd commit ourselves to learning together, that we'd, that we'd commit ourselves to growing and sharing life together again, that we commit ourselves to, to, to praying together, knowing that it's the power of prayer that changes things. There's a few ways you can do that here at Grace. One is it, I would make Sunday a non-negotiable. Make Sunday a non-negotiable for you. That you go, listen, it's not if I go to church, it's what do I need to change? What do I need to move in my life so that I make sure I'm there? Because you know the power and the need of being here so that you stay centered and it keeps you from drifting and that together we're learning from God together. And listen, it's something about gathering together that we experience the movement of God that encourages us and gets us going for the rest of the week. That we would make Sunday a non-negotiable. Second, get in a life group. Get in a life group. You can do that by, by the QR code. It gives you a link to, to say, I want to get in a group or gf.church slash links. But get in a life group. That's, that's a smaller gathering, and I get it. It's, I don't know these people. I, what if I don't have anything in common? You know what you have in common? Belief in Jesus Christ. That's all the early church had. And it was enough. It was enough. Get in a group. Find a group. Now, here's what I know. I know a lot of people say, man, I've been trying to get in a group, but they just haven't found one yet. There's two reasons. One is some people say, well, I need a group that's just like me, who thinks like me, who can meet at the very time I need to meet. <laughs> Maybe the group doesn't need to be about you. Maybe you just need to be open to God. Put me in a group where I can grow and I can understand community and I can be a part of his community. And the second part is maybe, maybe part of the struggle is we need some people to step up and say, I will lead a group and I'll host a group. There's a lot of people who are waiting to get in a group. And, and now's a great time to, to say, I, I'm, I'm in. If you're willing to host or and willing to lead, we'll give you the tools. We'll do our best. It, it's, I'll tell you this. It's not rocket science. The people who led the early church group, they didn't go through an a, a eight-hour course on, on how to be the church. We'll give you the tools you need. Let us know through that QR code, gf.church slash links. It's a great time to get involved. We have some, some extra uh, material that we're providing uh, that go along with this series, for this series. 
so that we can grow together. And then third is this, make prayer a priority. This Wednesday night, we have a thing called Abide. It's a night of prayer and praise. Commit to be here. Six six thirty. It's right here. It's not going to be streamed this week uh, be, because we want our ministry leaders to just be able to be and be present and be a part of it. But, but make it something you say, man. I'm a, I, I, and it, if you can't this time, we'll do it again at some point. But make prayer a priority uh, to gather together. Every week on Tuesday nights, this just started uh, last week. We have a prayer gathering every Tuesday at 6 p.m. right out here in, in the atrium. Pastor BJ is leading that, and, and I would love for you to join us. It's not a, a, a Bible study. It's not a worship service. It is a prayer gathering. We are going to pray and ask God to do things that we could never do on our own. Make prayer a priority. And listen, if grace isn't your speed, if this church, you go, man, this church is just a little much for me. I want you to know this. There are some great churches in our area with great preachers. He teach truth. And, and, and if you don't feel like this is your community, then go find one that you can be a part of, that you can go, man, this is my community. I need to be there. Here's the deal. We are not in competition with any other church. We need each other if we're going to change the world. So get involved. And if it's there, there, but if it's here, get involved here. Listen, the early church wasn't influential and didn't grow because they were so popular and politically powerful. They didn't grow because uh, it was easy and they had so much in common. They had, uh, th th they grew because of an uncommon commitment to their faith community. And instead of focusing on what they had different, they focused on a common belief. A belief in Jesus and a belief that only Jesus could change the world. And as a result of their faith, they were beaten and kicked out of their families and oppressed. Yet they continued to grow stronger. But instead of being a people who were angry and discouraged and fearful because of how unfair life had become. They were people, a community of people known for their joy and their generosity and their unexplainable hope. And God used their uncommon community to change the world. See, they discovered that their uncommon com commitment to their faith community positioned them to experience God's power. And here in America, because we've decided that faith is a per private thing and it's a personal thing, I think that we've positioned ourselves to miss out on seeing the power of God in community. A couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to do the wedding of one of my, a couple of my good friends. And one is now uh, the worship leader, D, uh, on, on our team here at Grace. And after the wedding, they, they were going to do a sparkler send-off. And they asked me to help light the sparklers, which I was very happy to do. Uh, and someone had the idea of, of, hey, it would be faster if we didn't just light them one at a time, if we lit them all together. Now, some of you already know what a bad idea that was, but we went with it. And, and we lit it and it blew up this incredible flame that burned off these dad's eyebrows. It was awesome, terrible, but awesome. And, and we had to drop it. I mean, we were just, we ran. I mean, it was crazy. Cool, but crazy. Because <laughs> here's the deal. One sparkler by itself, it might be nice to look at. It may be neat. But together, it's incredibly powerful. And listen, you may be able to follow Jesus by yourself. But when you join together with God's faith community, God does something so incredibly powerful. Listen, who needs the church? I do. You do. The world does. And an uncommon commitment to our faith community is the catalyst for change. I believe it's what God wants to use to change the world. 
And listen, when, when he begins to do that, and we start seeing lives changed, and the spiritual atmosphere change, I believe we will truly understand without a doubt that we are better together. Let's pray. Before I pray, if you're here today, I feel like God has put on my heart, there's people here today who need to receive him as their Lord, that you need to believe in him. Today after service, will you just come down front? There'll be a prayer team down here. Will you talk to them? Just let them know that today I need to put my trust in Jesus. God, my prayer is today that for those of us who believe in you, that we would trust you enough to be devoted to the community that you love, devoted to the community that you want to use to change the world. God, my prayer is that you will build your church here in this place and that we get to experience your power like that early church did. You did it before and I believe you can do it again. And I ask that you would do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, that message kind of strikes a chord with me about it being sometimes easier to not come to church. We have four small children and, uh, well, they're not so small anymore. They're growing, but the oldest is 11. But anyway, uh, and my husband works a schedule that doesn't let him necessarily help us get to church. So sometimes it's just me getting all four of us to church and it seems like it would be easier to just stay home and just watch online. But I will tell you that commitment to uh, a church community, and in our case, this church community has been a catalyst for huge growth and huge change in our lives personally. So it is hard to get here sometimes, but it is worth it. Uh, again, to touch on some things coming up in the life of our church, uh, Abide this Wednesday. Uh, this is a time of fellowship and prayer and praise, and we would love it if every one of you could be there. Now, uh, Again, this is a time where you are going to have to be here or be square because we are not live streaming it. We wanted to give a chance for our ministry leaders to be able to participate in this event with us so it will not be live streamed. Uh, if you're going to come, we have child care for uh, birth through second grade. Make sure that you register for that so that we can be prepared for your kiddos uh, and ready for them to come. Also coming up next week is a baptism. Let's clap for that. That's exciting. Baptism coming up. We love to celebrate with people as they take their next step uh, in their walk with Christ. If you have questions about baptism, go ahead and scan that QR code or you can come and talk to a person in the hub. Now, again, before you leave, there are going to be uh, members of our prayer team up here. If you would like somebody to pray with you about something, then go ahead and come forward. And if not, you guys have a great week.